Well, really, I have a simple one-point message this morning, which is the culmination, you know, really of all the other things we've been emphasizing. I just want to kind of bring it to a peak, just spend a few minutes doing this and um, get, you, get you thinking. Because really, really what I'm giving you is homework. I said the other day that I think the more you hunger for the baptism of the Spirit, the more you get when you get the breakthrough. So that if you pray, you know, single prayer, come forward in a meeting, single prayer, someone prays, oh, a little bit of a release, you speak in tongues. Uh, that's what happens to a lot of people. And yes, you know, there is a release and they start moving in the Spirit. What they should be doing is working on that to build it up. They've got a beginning. But I think when people are really hungry and they're searching and seeking and praying and waiting on God and, and nothing seems to happen and so they wait and they finally get a breakthrough, they seem to be clobbered a whole lot more with grace and power. It, it really is a call to be hungry and if you feel you're not hungry or not hungry enough, the simplest prayer you can pray is ask the Lord to make you hungry because it's amazing the momentum that kicks into your prayers once you do that. But what I want to appeal for is for you to believe that there is a bigger baptism of the Holy Spirit for you than you have already received. That is, I want you to start looking. In other words, we can't finish the work this morning. Yes, you can have a meeting where the Holy Spirit moves. You can have a meeting where everyone got drunk on the floor. We've had those kinds of meetings. But we're now looking for something of another order, another grace. And it means you're going to have to take the time to, to day by day praying things through, seeing the cleansing of the heart. You know, the old analogy was, uh, if you, you know, if you've got a bucket that's full of rocks, you can fill it with water and the water will overflow, but there's not as much water in it as if you took out a few rocks and kept pouring water till it overflowed. And human lives are full of things that need to go. And this is why, you know, the, the early Soviet Army used to dwell a lot on getting people to, to give up any, even anything that was doubtful in their lives. Great conviction used to come on those meetings and they're very suspicious of anybody that's, that claimed to have experiences of God, but it seemed to limit their self-denial or their hard work for the gospel. They were two measures, the people willing to sacrifice anything for souls, for, to reach out to souls, and they're willing to give up anything in their own lives. Those early salvationists, they wouldn't travel second class if there was a third class, because all the funds spared were for the gospel. William Booth, the founder of the Salvation Army, he refused to take a penny for himself. Do you know there were, he was the most hated man in all of England and he became the most loved man in all of England. And there was a period where both those were happening at the same time. But there were very, very wealthy people who would send him blank checks and tell him to fill in any amount he wanted as long as he would take it for himself. People wanted wanted him to have something for himself, he would send the checks back blank. Had they offered it for the work, he would have filled it in and taken it with both hands. He always refused every penny for himself. He was publicly vilified though and accused of enriching himself, but the thing was the furthest from the truth. Because the point I'm making is, they so believed in sacrificing everything for the sake of the word of God and souls. We were brought up in that culture. A culture of um, hard work, self-denial. And that nothing was for yourself. Everything was for the ministry. So um, in 1978, when I felt I needed a trailer, but needed it so that wherever I moved, I could take with me, I had this whopping printing press, and the, the, sell it. the army would move you every two or three years, well, you've got to move the thing. I had to actually overcome all the culturally ingrained stuff 
to be able to pray for the Lord to give me something that I would hold on to rather than it was for the local church. Everything was for the work. Uh, I'm only saying that to demonstrate the, the level of um, devotion and sacrifice that was in not a few, but in fact huge numbers, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of Christians in those days. And the reason was because they had received a real baptism of the Holy Spirit. It wasn't just a baptism of the Spirit that you felt good and felt free. I mean, these are benefits, right? These are wonderful benefits. Oh, such a release and some bondage is falling away and you can pray with liberty and you can rejoice and enjoy the Lord and spiritual gifts, you can prophesy and speak in tongues, you can heal the sick. These things you want and must have and thank God for the people who pressed in to make that the kind of reality that would spread across the world to the whole church you know, the Pentecostal movement, the charismatic movement. But in the process, by the way, that began with people who understood the holiness movement. That is the belief that you could find a baptism of the spirit that would make you holy and you would live a sacrificial life for souls. It was people who had that who thought there's more here, there's gifts. We've got to go the other way and say there's more here. There's power for holiness and witnessing. You, you want the whole package. You don't want, look, the baptism of the Spirit, it is the Holy Spirit, but what, what tends to happen in life is you receive what you believe for. So if your focus is this section over here and these are the, the outcomes you want, you'll, you'll get a breakthrough, you'll get liberty in those things and you might get another couple of things thrown in. But the ancients, their focus was over here. And mind you, it was a big focus. Wesley, it was Wesley who taught the baptism of the Spirit. A long time before, we're talking a couple of hundred years before Pente what we think of as you know, Pentecost, Azusa Street. Wesley, he taught the mighty Pentecostal baptism of the Holy Spirit. And it had multiple names. And one of the names for it was perfect love. You would be endued with love from on high, so filled with the love of God, you, you, your whole life, would you're willing to lay out your life for the sake of souls in the kingdom of God and, and live holy lives. It was, see, holy, living holy lives wasn't just an ideal, it was empowered by the Holy Spirit. And everyone born again in those early days, because we were still hearing these messages when we grew up, was urged, encouraged to seek this grace, seek what was called the blessing of holiness. It's sometimes called the second blessing, sometimes called entire sanctification, sometimes called full salvation. So they preached the gospel. They were getting alcoholics and prostitutes converted. Ultimately, rich people got converted too. You know, those early Salvation Army meetings, there was always a pendant form. People come kneel, weeping for their sins. Someone would help them. You know, drunkards and wealthy ladies, they'd be all lined up side by side. But if you came forward dressed in finery, you know, you had feathers in the hat, fancy buttons, there was someone there with scissors to cut that stuff off. <laughs> no, 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 no showiness, no, Austin, no, you know, you're, you're being born again into a new life. <laughs> and uh, these were, and they were rollicking meetings. That's why they, Somebody, somebody, you know, said last night, somebody talking too long is all getting boring. No, they just start to sing, you know. That meeting had to move on, you know. <laughs> uh, just great days. There was a Castrol ad years ago. Remember the old Castrol ads, Oils Ain't Oils? They, they had some great ads. Well, one of them was a, a caricature, no doubt, but it was actually a, an old early time Salvation Army meeting. I'd love to find that old ad. I'm certain you can't find it. And put it up here on the screens here to see what what an army meeting was actually like, you know, <laughs> with, with uh, you know, the, the prostitutes and the drunkards and the rich and the poor, and they're all singing away and the meeting's rollicking along. <laughs> and uh, anyway, look, you can't, you can't reproduce that culture, those times, or their answers for the culture of the day. The culture of their day had big problems. 
alcoholics, you know, children were constantly drunk. The cheapest drink you could buy in London was gin. And there were steps in the bars so little children of three and four years old could get up and buy their drinks. Many babies were born drunk. The, the, the slave trade in white girls slipped drugged out of England at 12 and 13 years old off to the continent as slaves. No, the Salvation Army took all that on. And it was in that context, you know, they're in the streets, but attacked by roughs, attacked by a crowd called the Skeleton Army. And the, the way they got brass bands, by the way, was the Fry family, they weren't even Sally's, but father and a few sons, they played instruments. And they decided they'd go and help protect the Salvation Army meeting that act as bouncers and took their instruments along. So they supplied some music, but they're also the strong guys. Well, that's how Salvation Army bands started because it had such appeal, drew crowds. Next thing you know, bands proliferated, uniforms. It was it, the, almost everything you know about the Salvation Army today is just kind of a leftover skeleton of this astounding thing. I mean, Booth, as one evangelist, became 10,000 evangelists in 25 years across 80 nations. I mean, it was a huge movement. But the thing that empowered it was a real baptism of the Holy Spirit. But Wesley was Booth's hero. And it was Wesley that developed the doctrine. And with all those names, you know, full salvation, entire sanctification, perfect love, and being filled with the Spirit as well as the baptism of the Holy Spirit. But the, well, they were looking for a baptism of the Spirit that didn't just give them the power to move in the Spirit when it came to prayer and prophecy and healing and feeling better about yourself. They were looking for a baptism of the Spirit that totally transformed their lives and gave them power to live the Christian life in all holiness, willing to suffer any privation, any loss, give yourself endlessly to any service for the sake of the kingdom of God and have actual power to win souls. I've discovered there's one more thing in the baptism of the Spirit than that. So in other words, it's, it's all that the Pentecostals found. It's all that the Wesleyans and the Sallies and others found. But it's more. That a real baptism of the Spirit causes the people of God to be a people. The initial pouring out of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost was a group event. 120 people in the upper room and the Holy Spirit simultaneously, instantly transformed 120 lives. It was a group anointing. It was a corporate work. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit. And that's why we call it the birthday of the church, because up until then they were followers of Jesus, but they did not really walk properly with each other. And from that time they became, the Bible says, of one heart and one mind. And that state of grace, the unity of the church, this, this being a holy nation, this being a royal priesthood, this being a people who rise as one and speak with one voice, the whole power of community, it comes from Pentecost. It comes from having a proper baptism of the Holy Spirit. So much so, and I think that's the pinnacle the trouble is you don't want to miss the other. You don't want to miss the giftedness on the one hand, nor the power to live for souls in a holy life on the other. But you mustn't miss this pinnacle of grace where you become one with the believers. And so I, I've had a lot of fun over these years going into uh, Pentecostal churches, well, primarily AOG churches, have a lot of fun and telling them they're not Pentecostal because they don't love each other. Just toying with them a bit, right? <laughs> but first of all, I teach all that, and so you get to the punchline, you know, which is, unless you love each other deeply from the heart, unless you really are one with your leadership, you know, unless you're a people of one heart, one mind, you're not Pentecostal. 
So I'm, I'm, I'm arguing for a greater expression of the baptism of the Spirit. So with that in mind, I'm going to read you a letter from General William Booth. I haven't read this to a crowd in years. And, and uh, so that means our bunch, 90% of them wouldn't remember what was in the letter if they did the first time. And the rest of you haven't heard it yet. But it was printed in the Christian mission paper, which that was the, the thing that they had before they invented the war cry. Dated 1st of April, 1869, William Booth had written a letter to, um, now it's, it's the Dunedin Hall Christian Mission. It, it was the Christian mission that became the Salvation Army. Edinburgh. Well, where's Edinburgh? We all know, don't we? It's in Scotland. So he writes from London to Scotland. They must have sent an inquiry. People with problems did write letters to William Booth. You know, one of his, one of his evangelists wrote in and on behalf of the mission station they were at and said, you know, they'd try everything and they still couldn't get a breakthrough for souls. And he wrote back and said, try tears. In other words, in your prayers, you weep over it. Someone else, he said to them, if you want them to bleed, you'll have to hemorrhage. But here he writes to the, the brethren and sisters laboring for Jesus in connection with the Dunedin Hall Christian Mission, Edinburgh. He says, success in soul winning, like all other work, both human and divine, depends on certain conditions. You must be careful to comply with these conditions. I desire to give a few brief practical hints, but first and foremost, I commend one qualification which seems to involve all the others. That is the Pentecostal baptism of the Holy Ghost. I would have you settle it in your souls forever. This one great immutable principle in the economy of grace that spiritual work can only be done by those who possess spiritual power. Many mistake here. Aroused by the inward urgings of the Holy Spirit, they endeavor to comply with the call that comes from the word and the necessities of their fellow men. But being destitute of power, they fail. And instead of going to the strong for strength, they give up in despair. Again aroused, again they resolve and venture forth. But having no more power than before, they are as impotent as ever and fail they must until baptized with power from on high. This, I am convinced, is the one great need of the church. We want no new truths, agencies, means, or appliances. We only want more of the fire of the Holy Ghost. This is what you dear Edinburgh friends need. The baptism of the Holy Ghost and fire. I would not have you think that I imagine for a moment that you have not the Spirit. By your fruits I know you. No men could do the works that are being done in your midst except God was with them. But how much more might be done had you all received this Pentecostal baptism in all its fullness? What zeal, what self-denial, what meekness, boldness, holiness, love would there not be? And, all, uh, and with all this, what power for your great work? The whole city would feel it. God's people in every direction would catch the fire and sinners would fall on every side. Difficulties would vanish, infidels believe, and the glory of God be displayed. You do desire to see signs and wonders wrought in the name of Jesus, to see a great awakening among the careless crowds around you, to see hundreds or thousands of feet turned into the way of life. Would, I know, put gladness in your heart more than in the time when your corn and wine increase. This baptism then is your first great need. If you think with me, will you not tarry for it? Offer yourselves to God for the fullness. Lay aside every weight. Hold on. Though your feelings are barren, your way dark and your difficulties be multiplied, steadily hang on to the word of God. Expect the baptism every hour. Wait if he tarry. He quotes the scripture. This kind goeth forth um, 
This kind goeth not forth but by prayer and fasting. And he quotes the scripture again, the Lord whom you seek shall come suddenly to his temple. Well, there you are. If you want a copy of the letter, you can ask me nicely. And, um, and he has in it the advice needed, that bit at the end. Now, I'm giving you some homework. I, I would like to think that you go out from here to all points of the compass and you begin this purpose afresh, no matter how much of the Holy Spirit you've had before, no matter how much anointing you've had, no matter how much, no matter how much giftedness. There is very unusual giftedness available, not just the usual, you know, tongues, prophecy, healing, and words of knowledge. There's um, a great variety of giftedness in addition to all of that. You think of Felix's gift, being able to look around a crowd and see who's ready to be led to the Lord. Hmm? You think of Apollos' gift in the Philippines where when the, when the Spirit of the Lord came on him, he never had to sleep a wink the rest of his life and he spent all his nights searching the Scriptures. And the result was he had such authority and he had such understanding. Unusual gifts. I remember another man came to Australia as an American preacher and he had an unusual gift. He could take the hand of any person and immediately rattle off. He had, he had an instant recall of 7,000 promises in scripture and he could instantly rattle off for you six or seven promises the Lord was giving you right there on the spot. Unusual gifts. But see, um, these things are available. So I'm quickly, a couple of scriptures and, and I can close with prayer. There's only a couple of scriptures today. Here's the first, Acts 10, 37, 38. This is about Jesus. Just follow with me in like three simple steps. Luke wrote, you yourselves know what happened. Actually, this is preaching. This is um, Peter preaching. You yourselves know what happened through all Judea, beginning from, the, from Galilee, after the baptism that John proclaimed, how God anointed Jesus with Nazareth, of Nazareth, with the Holy Spirit and with power. We've had a power emphasis in this conference. Anointed with the Holy Spirit and with power. And he went about doing good and healing all who are oppressed by the devil. The point to make here is for Jesus to minister, he had to be first baptized. He was 30 years old. He bided his time. When the right time came, in the sovereignty of God, he was baptized. It's why he's called the anointed one. The word Christ means anointed one. The word Messiah is the same word in Hebrew, anointed one. And that's the anointing we're talking about. At, at the Jordan, Spirit of God comes on him bodily. Then he was possessed of this power to heal the sick, you know, and all the rest he did. He never walked on water and turned water into wine until after he had that baptism of power. Remember he said, you can do the same things. If he needs it, you need it and you don't have enough. Here's what he said. He himself said this, Acts 1.8, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you'll be my witnesses. So power to witness. I mean, what do you need to be a witness? All you need is know something and say to people, yeah, I saw it, here's what it was. That's normal witnessing. No, no, he's talking about a different kind of witnessing. He's talking about speaking a word that has power to reveal the resurrected Christ. And so he, Jesus gave us this word, Luke 11, I tell you, ask, he says. And I tell you, ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks, receive, and the one who seeks, finds, and to the one who knocks, it will be opened. And just three verses later, he says, if you then are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him. And if Jesus makes that application, yes, asking, seeking, and knocking applies to all things in life, but he makes a specific application so you can say it especially applies to seeking the Holy Spirit and power. And last verse, to the woman at the well, Jesus said, ah, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that's speaking to you, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Still the same. 
still the same. So, dear friends, we're going to quit uh, at that point. I just wanted to make you hungry for more and to give you a basis for believing you could have more, but I want you to pursue it. I want all the people in peace to pursue it, our staff to pursue it, our prayer meetings we pursue it, and all the others we're sending out start pursuing. I would like to think three months from now, six months from now, nine months from now, in all kinds of places, the Holy Spirit is falling on people and empowering you in new ways. And you won't see the invisible trail, but you know, it'll come back from the word the Lord has spoken to you here today, uh, well, in these days. And it's the Lord, you know. I don't, I don't sit and make all these things up and think, well, this will be a good program or this might move souls. Almost everything I say, it just if, if the Lord doesn't talk, I got nothing to say. It's, he is saying these things. I can pray for weeks and weeks and, and, and have tried to make notes and I get nothing. It's, it's a difficult life. A big conference going out. <laughs> I haven't got a clue what I'm going to say. No, but he, wa- he wants to talk. That's why. And, and I'm telling you, he is saying this. It's the word of God. So do you think we could resolve in our hearts? Like proper resolution is very important. Like it's not enough just to be moved in a meeting. There's got to be some kind of decision in the heart made that is resolute. You know, a, a choice, a setting of your heart to pursue. And um, so that's why I say it's, it's homework, you know. You burn, burn some midnight oil. And at the same time, remember, I've given you from in Colossians 1.9 a prayer Lord, would you fill me with the knowledge of your will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding? <coughs> Ephesians 1, 15. Lord, would you grant me the spirit of revelation in the wisdom and knowledge of Christ? See, that, that, it's, they're kind of identical items, parallel items. These are the kind of prayers, in other words, you're going to seek God. You're going to seek to be filled with the knowledge of his will, filled with anointing, granted revelation, granted understanding, granted power, But all of this, I think, in the context of saying, Lord, I don't have enough. I must have more, must have more of the Holy Spirit. You are looking for a greater baptism of the Holy Spirit. Don't tell me it's not possible to have a second and a third. Do you know the Baptist objection, the traditional Baptist objection to the Pentecostal position was, no, you can have many experiences of the Holy Spirit. (laughs) It was one of their ways of dodging, you know, the big one, but... But still, Charles Finney, his testimony is that on a Wednesday morning, he was converted, but on the afternoon of the same day, he had multiple baptisms of the Holy Spirit until he had to cry and ask the Lord to stop. Well, makes us feel like poor. We've only had one. (laughs) Now, friends, back to that place of calling on the Lord, ask and you will receive. So I, I give myself the homework too, honestly. After all these years, I've decided no, enough's not enough. You know, <laughs> there must be more. So we'll, we'll have some simple prayer together. Ask the band to come back, and uh, they will, in a moment, help us to rejoice in the closing of the service. And there'll be morning tea, and followed by lunch, lunch by about noon. But uh, once the band is here, I want you to pray with me. I want to pray with you because we're going to believe God. It, it, it's in a sense like we're not, we're not closing it like the work is done. We're going to believe that there's, there's an ongoing work here, on, an ongoing thing. All right, pray with me. Take this quiet moment to express your desires to the Lord. Let him know your heart. Well, he knows your heart and you, have, you know your feelings, but 
This falls into the category of needing to ask. It's not enough to say the Lord knows what I need and if he wants to give it to me, he will. This will never, ever work. You will get nothing. You must ask. Even though he knows all about it, even though you know all about it, you must communicate. Ask and you'll receive. In another place, you have not because you did not ask, James said. It's like the day two blind men were crying out. They cried out all morning. Son of David, have mercy. It's pretty obvious what they wanted. They were blind. Jesus eventually turned. What did he say? What do you want? You must tell him. Go ahead right now. In, in your heart of hearts, tell the Lord what you want. I'll give you a minute. Father, we pray together, for we all have this same need and heart's desire, that you would grant to us more of the Holy Spirit and power. The baptism of the Holy Spirit and fire. You anointed Jesus with the Holy Spirit and power. He came out of his prayers in the desert in the power of the Spirit and we seek this. I pray for all of those here today, hungry for the Lord. I ask that by your grace, by the power of your hand, you would enable every one of these in seeking the face of God to find fresh anointing, fresh power, to find the baptism of the Spirit, to break through to have the hindrances cleaned away, the fetters broken, to find deliverance, to find liberty and freedom, to break through into the liberty of the Holy Spirit. Lord, I ask you to empower your people, empower me, empower these ministers, empower the believers, empower our families, grant power, grant more of the Holy Spirit. We knock on Heaven's door, we knock on the door of these promises. I ask you, Lord, that this coming 12 months would see such a transformation in lives, in churches. Let us see the power of the Spirit move afresh amongst us. As Booth himself said, we want another Pentecost. But I thank you, Lord, we can all, we can all walk in that grace today and tomorrow, Lord, we seek. We seek the power of your name. We seek the power of the right hand of the Most High. And thank you, we have your promises and we have received grace, but as Jesus said, we seek more. That we might be empowered for service, empowered for witness, empowered for prayer, empowered for holy living empowered with the mind of the Lord and with the life of the Spirit. Come Holy Spirit, rest now upon every one of these believers. Your presence be with them. I ask the Lord that they would know day by day what it is like to sit in your presence and to seek your face. Cleansing, oh God. Wash away every sin. Wash away guilt and false loves the ways in which the heart is tied to many things, Lord, there are breakthroughs needed. Light, let light flood every soul. That in seeking that which is better, they would see clearly what to throw away, what to give up. So Lord, I place every last one of these today, myself included, under the hand of God, 
seeking the instruction of the Spirit, the conviction of your grace, as well as the empowering of your word. Let the fire of God burn within every heart. We seek this grace. I thank you for those who have gathered at the summit this year. Thank you for bringing them safely. Carry them home safely. And I pray the blessings of this hour, the, the word of God and the attendance of the Holy Spirit upon each would not depart from them. Jesus, you said, I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. So I ask that your great grace and holy angels, the presence of God, the love of the Father would go with them all, be with them. Continue to instruct. And I pray, Lord, that in the coming weeks, every one of these whose heart is hungry for God, they would receive revelation from heaven, that understanding would grow, the riches of grace be multiplied within them, and that all of us would be enabled to live in another way, at another level, and to walk in an, an altogether better expression of life because of the grace given to us. Thank you for the mysteries of Christ revealed. Thank you for miracles that are constantly given. Thank you for the hand of God and thank you for victory in spiritual war. We give praise to God. We take our rest in the Lord Jesus, who is our Sabbath and our Savior and our Deliverer. Lord, we thank you. We give praise to God in Jesus' name. Amen.